Yeah, you might not like me too much after this. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Corey. I've been writing code for 10-ish years, as a guess. Been Java pretty much the whole time. Uh, as with that, I have a bit of a different approach to a lot of people that have come from other languages and stuff. You know, the other languages have these frameworks and blah, blah, blah. I never had, well, I had vaguely that, you know, you, you can't get out of QUT without doing .NET. Uh, they love Microsoft there. Anyway, so this talk is um, pretty much just opinion. Uh, you, you're not really here to actually get facts and learn from me. Um, it's just to listen to me talk, basically. Um, <laughs> but this is stuff that's worked well for me and my team that I've worked with in the past as well. So maybe it'll take something away from me. So, straight up, write test first. This seems like a really obvious thing. And a lot of people are like, yeah, it's a great idea, but I don't have time. If you don't have time, you, you're never going to do it. Just do it. Um, on this point, I'll really quickly go into it. I find that business code is useless to unit test. Uh, your unit tests get really mocky, and mocks are terrible. It gets really convoluted. And as soon as you change your business logic, which is pretty much all the time, because that's what you're actually there to write code for, or you unit test for. They just completely die. Um, it's actually really easy to integrate unit test uh, stuff in, like, uh, in Node, that is. Because <coughs> uh, you can just spin up your server, point it as like a fake database or whatever, and then make HTTP requests with like a, you know, like, uh, like a request module in Node, and check that you've got the right code and the right data. Pretty simple. People don't do this, I don't know why. Um, yeah. Code quality is like, 10 times more important than I've seen most teams care about. They're like, oh, I like to keep my code clean, but you know, sometimes you just gotta slam in and make it work. Yeah, sure, you can do that once. Come back to it immediately. Like if you have to, if you've got something really critical that needs to be fixed, sure, fix it, sure, no problems, but come back and clean it. Don't just produce stuff over time and then like let it get messy. Constantly go back and, and fix up your code, make sure it's high quality. Uh, so as much as there is obviously a disconnect between the code you write and the product you create, there's, there is, there's a leak there, you know. If you have poor quality code, it's going to be harder to maintain, it's going to be harder to produce the features that you want, the time that you want, and that will shine through. Um, quality code is definitely faster to add features to, I don't know if anyone's here is working in like a legacy code base, everyone's working in a legacy code base, and it's just like a pain and everything takes so long to get anywhere. So. Yeah, try and keep your shit good. The best code is no code. <laughs> code kind of bugs if you don't have any code. Sometimes you need code though. Um, I don't know too many projects that don't have any code, but the less code the better generally, because the less code there is, the less code there is to go wrong. Um, when you do write code, keep it minimal. Don't over embellish what you need to do. Don't try and overthink it. Obviously I'm not saying, you know, if there's if there's something three steps ahead of you, don't have to do all that, obviously, but don't go out of your way to add crap into your project just for the sake of it. You probably don't need the thing that you think you need, so don't add it. Here's the first one. Yes, yeah, so this is the slide I'm going to see, I think, I'm going to get the most uh, disagreement with. Um, I use these frameworks a lot. Uh, <coughs> to be fair, I didn't use very many of other people's frameworks. I used to make my own. Um, <laughs> but even the ones I made were really quite not framework -y. they were quite simple, they weren't very uh, involved, but even those ones I found very frustrating over time. Um, they feel really good at the start, you know, you go install, and then like 30 minutes later after it's installed, 25 <laughs> gigabytes of crap, you can go, oh, I can create a route, I can create a route, I can create a route, or I can create a view and a template in it. In the, like, Great, that feels really good the first day, and it feels okay the second day, and by the third day you're like, gee, I wish I could just do this one thing, but it doesn't work. Or you find a bug, and it's like deep in the bowels of a dependency of a dependency of a dependency, and you go, oh, hey, maintainer, can you please have a look at this? And you're like, what, I don't even know what you're talking about. It works perfectly on my machine, and then three weeks later you still haven't moved anywhere, and you're just running hacks in your own code to get around. Ugh, shorten your stack, move quickly. Tools are good. So if you want small tools, have low dependency depth, hopefully. I 
mean, I'm not saying don't use stuff that has any dependencies. Modularization is excellent, but don't go for like, oh, well, yeah, I'm about to get to it. Actually, it's right there in, in the blue text right here. Pretty much, it's got an underscore, has its namespace. You don't need it. There's, I've never, ever, ever seen a usage of underscore or lodash that couldn't have been done with like one require, which was maybe a couple of bytes, not even kilobytes, or is a native function. Because if you import one of these things, even like everyone's like, oh, you can always split it, but no one ever splits it. Everyone's just like, oh, I'm too lazy. Just give me all of underscore, and then like 10 megabytes later, you wonder why your project's enormous and doesn't go across the wire properly. Just delete that, that dependency, and you'll be done. Because 80% of your code that you use with this is gonna be like for each, or map, or fold, or everything that already exists in JavaScript. And then there might be this odd one that, you know, it's a bit obscure. So go to npm, type the exact name of that thing, and you'll find an equivalent tool. So actually I made a really helpful transitional tool for this called Blunderscore. Um, basically you just do a find replace your type code base for underscore or for all of Ladash and replace it with Blunderscore in the require. And what it does is when you call it, it just, um, it just throws an error that says, with a, with a URL that links that function name into npm, which every single time gives you a single module that does exactly the same task. <laughs> I've screwed myself up here because I don't know how to go back. <laughs> I don't know how Max work. <laughs> Two finger swipe which way? <laughs> okay, so avoid uh, tools that have like a really lock in API. So things that pretend not to be a framework but definitely are, like React. I mean, what? Um, <laughs> does anyone really think React's not a framework? It's a library, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally a library. Basically, if, if you're using a thing, and I actually just had this discussion before, if you're using a tool that you couldn't completely replace in your project in a week, don't. I could write React in a week. You probably could react, and I'm about to get to that. You probably could react, write React in a week. I'll get to that later, but anyway. You probably could write React in a week. But could you replace React in your project in a week? I can answer that point, no, you couldn't. Unless your project is like Hello World, you couldn't do that. I've got nothing else to do, <laughs> You drink a whole lot of beer drinks. Shit goes wrong. All the time, you know it does. You like half your job is like, oh, it didn't work. Better make it work, you know. <laughs> it's amazing to me that people don't realize that their job is not to sit there and hit keys and make code appear. Their job is to sit there and go, how do I make this work? Or it's not working. How do I make it work? Or how do I make it work differently? You know, that's your job. Not 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 hit keys. Anybody can do that. Plan for shit to go wrong. The less things that can go wrong, the better. So. Read your code that you're importing. Don't just import, don't be like, import random thing and hope it works. For starters, I mean, even from a purely uh, like security perspective, NPM can run scripts on installation, like user land scripts, like read your SSH keys and send them to a server. Every script can potentially do that. Not that I'm suggesting like be like, we'll tinfoil a hat and don't install stuff, but I'm just saying generally, every time you go looking for a, a, a thing to use, Look at the code. If you think, gee, that's a lot of work, it's, it, then don't use it. It's too big. It's too big to use then. Simply because you, later, at some point, it's going to break because everything breaks. And then you're going to have to spend however long digging through it and go, oh, gee, okay, the bug wasn't actually in that library. It was in its dependency, in a dependency in like a, like a, what's that, it's like a, what's that link dependency thing that people, yeah. peer dependency, like a peer dependency of a thing of a, and it's just painful. And I'm getting a phone call from my wife, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, should I answer it? Uh, I might just, uh, oh, I probably shouldn't be. It's not worth the risk to not answer it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, that's a joke I meant to say before. Uh, the guy at work came up with about 
what you and your timing stuff. He said, how do you know if a, if a developer's not working, they're writing code, or they're hitting the keyboard. If you can hear someone typing, they're not working. Because <laughs> they're, they're chatting to someone, or they're like, you know, write, spamming a comment on Reddit. Code doesn't sound like this. It sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> and then like, F5, no. <laughs> that's, that's actual work, you know? Um, people don't have a lot of confidence that they know what is good code or what is not good code. But if you don't know what good code or what bad code is, then how could you possibly debug it or deal with it in the future? You know, just go for code that you're, you're comfortable with. Like, read the source code. If you're comfortable in that source code, if you think, yeah, this is alright, this sounds perfect. You have a couple of promises here and there. But, you know, it, it, uh, just make sure it's like you're okay with it. Because when it goes wrong, you're the person that's going to have to go reading through it. So definitely read your code. Look for tests. If it doesn't have tests, it's a really bad sign. If it does have tests, it's a really good sign. Um, it's really polarizing, actually. Like, it, the, it, there's no middle ground. There's no tests. It's like, uh, it's kind of, you know, cat. If, if it does break, and you say to the, to the library uh, author, hey, this is broken, what are they going to do? Like, run the tests? You can't. There's no tests. If it has tests, it's so good because you just write a failing test, you set, send a pull request. The people, library authors love pull requests. There's nothing worse than like, it doesn't work. You just go, mm. <laughs> yeah, okay, damn, sorry, bye, close issue. You know, but even a pull request that, that sends a test, even if you don't do any actual work as such, just prove that your thing failed, that is like 10 times better than just saying it failed. So tests are great for that. Yeah, so read the source, I pretty much just said all of this. Uh, if you don't understand it, probably don't use it because you couldn't replace it and therefore you're going to get stalled for a week or more when you inevitably find that massive problem that you never encountered before. Sometimes you need to use bad tools, for example SQLize. My god, SQLize is disgusting, I hate it so much. Now obviously this is probably because I hate promises so much and because if you do anything at all on a keyboard, like if you just put your cursor anywhere in your file and just like and then run it, it'll just go, yeah, no problems, 500. Because SQLizer uses promises, and promises just catch everything. No matter what you do, it just catches everything. Other than like, obviously if your code can't parse, it won't get that far. But if your code runs, and it crashes, promise just goes, whoa, hold on. Eh, yeah, 500. Yep. So if you don't use promises, how do you do async? Because oh, promises is the <laughs> only way to do async, yeah? yeah async await then. That's, that's oh, it's good. Like async await is promises. And it catches all your errors. You know that? I don't know. Is this a joke or a serious question? No, it's new. It's like it's the new way to do it. Oh my god, how do you use a computer? <laughs> <laughs> it's like mash the keys until something happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is like off topic, but I don't care, I like it. Here's, here's, an, here's my response I prepared earlier. Uh, presented at a previous talk, that's right. Uh, TLDIs, here's promises, this doesn't even exist in promises, but you need to use it, otherwise your code's going to be terrible, so it doesn't really exist, you've got to use Bluebird, so there goes like 50 kilobytes of your package straight away, also you got APM installed, it takes 20 minutes. Uh, so, cool. Um, Rado is a thing that I made, you're going to see that a lot, I make a lot of stuff. Um, Rado has a very similar API to promises, you, um, it, but it works really nicely with callback passing style, so everything in existence basically other than promises, oh by the way it also works with promises. Um, so you just go like Rado callback passing style function, any argument you ever want to pass to it, and if any of those arguments are a previous Rado that results from that, it will wait until they're done and pass it in. Which means your dependency, your asynchronous dependency graph just runs as fast as it can. You don't need to go, oh await this, you know, time it correctly, you just don't care. You just, this function beats to this function, this, to this one. Maybe I need all of those things to happen, cool. You just go write it up, all those things, pass me to this one. It just, it's because it's just a simple dependency graph. You don't need to care about when stuff is executing because it just executes in the order that you ask, that it needs to, to, to complete the task that's required. Um, the other thing that I don't like about promises, other than the fact that they gobble errors, which is like 90% of why I don't like them, is they are eager. They eagerly run. You go like var x equals new promise, do something, and by the next line it's like in black. Even if maybe you didn't want it to happen, or at all, potentially. 
uh, whereas Rhino is uh, lazily executed. So if you have like a Rhino dependency and then one that depends on it, neither of them will run until you run that second one, which will go, oh, I need that thing. So it'll run that, it'll respond. If the second one, it'll respond, and it works. Which means you can do stuff like, uh, you know, like do uh, if statements or whatever, and you can like assign a thing or assign a thing, and you can just not use it and it won't run. It's kind of handy. Um, yeah, so super TLDR of it is, so there's, uh, if you just type a random, this is completely off topic, but I like this topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, Beating the trolls, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you just like type random stuff and then try and run it, that'll throw the promise will catch it and it'll reject. It won't take your server down. I'd prefer my server to crash if I wrote the wrong code. Um, in Rhino, it looks almost exactly the same. Like it's really the same code, basically, except that it plays nicely with uh, the standard error, part, uh, error back style. Uh, if you do that, it will throw and give you a stack trace on the exact line that it happened. Uh, the other thing that's quite nice um, is you can run debug mode on Rhino and it'll give you asynchronous uh, stack traces and where the stack is actually a dependency graph. So not just like code stack, but like dependency stack. And it'll show you like this task error and then it'll highlight in red, this is the task specifically out of all of the tasks in the stack that had the error. And it'll tell you the line in that task that it like, uh, rejected from or whatever where it was uh, sorry used so you can go and just find oh, okay that's the dependency cool fix that one so that's quite handy as well um, okay uh, yeah back to the thing yeah yeah so uh, back on topic uh, CLI sucks um, I mean it, like anyway it's actually it's, uh, it's very useful that's why we use it really useful but it sucks at the same time. Um, so we write wrappers around stuff like that because one day I'm gonna like get so frustrated with it that I'm just gonna thought, I don't know, I'm gonna say write my name, but everyone's gonna laugh at that, it doesn't matter. Um, you'll see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should well, write your own code. I, I will. <laughs> anyway, that's the thing. If you write a wrapper around it, um, you can work on resolving that either by plugging in something else and then without going through your entire code base and like updating a million files, you just like plug in, oh, instead of doing SQLize, do something less terrible and it just works. That's where wrappers come in nicely. If something has a crappy API but you need to use it, wrap it in a nice API. And a nice API doesn't mean like, don't sit there and stress over like what a nice API is. A nice API is an API you like to use. You're the developer. You're the one that's gonna have to use it. Red wheels don't fit your car. Everyone says you don't reinvent the wheel. These wheels look ridiculous. <laughs> They're stupid. <laughs> don't assume existing wheels are good enough. Make them fit your software and make them for fun. So if you see a tool and you're like, gee, I wonder how that works, make it. Just make it again, even if it's like anything. Just make code because you'll then you'll understand how it works. And then the good part about understanding how stuff works, even if you, even if you didn't make it, is when it breaks, you go, I think I know why, why it's broken because I'm pretty sure I know, you know how, I, how I would have done it. I would have forgotten that one thing, you know. And then you go, yeah, okay, there it is. Stand for request done, fixed. Popularity is a bad metric. Uh, sorry for anyone who has one of these cards. <laughs> anyway, um, just because there are a lot of people using it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, it's pretty basic, really, pretty obvious. I would have thought it's one of those things where everyone's like, oh man, popular stuff. Don't just go for popular stuff. And they're like, Oh, it's React now. I just anyway. <laughs> Throw back slide. Small is good. So when you're shipping code across the wire, this is more browser side stuff. You want to ship the least amount of stuff. If you need to split your bundle, you have too much code. I have never come across any use case that would possibly need split bundles. The only thing I can think that would be like vaguely required is if you're in like a third world country and the the data rate is so insanely slow that you know like a 50 kilobyte file will take too long. But let's be honest, we're pretty privileged in this society here. We're, some of us, yes, you're gonna be using it for like other countries and stuff like that, great. Do what you need to do. But for the majority of the case, you don't need to do it. Just just ship one small file and be done with it. You know, every every little thing you add, like underscore, etc., react, all of these things that aren't your actual code, they're just like some stuff that you think helps you, 
That's, that's what makes up like 90% of the bundle. And, and you think, oh, it's probably not, it's like 50, no, it's like actually 90% of the bundle. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> know how to do what you don't have time to do, because actually what I said before. If every time you go to install a thing that you don't have time to build yourself, try and make sure you pretty much know how you would build it if you had time to build it. If you're just like going to install a thing, you're like, man, I got no idea how it does that. That's risk later. Like, at some point you're going to have to deal with it, and it's going to slow you down horribly. And maybe you'll make a bad decision because you have no idea what you're doing, and you won't just slow yourself down. You slow your whole team down. So like, oh, you know, I made a, made a mistake. Use this thing. We got to rip it out. There's tons of shit built for it already in your project. Uh, okay, great. Redo all that stuff. So have a pretty good idea what you're doing when it comes to like using stuff. Nothing is magic. Uh, a lot of people. A few people, a lot of people, I don't know, many people you like think that they couldn't write certain things. And this is what I was saying here. You probably could write React. Like, you could definitely write React. It doesn't do it doesn't do anything. It just takes strings and just like gets a like it's just you can do a string of place value. That's pretty much what React is. It has some caching, etc., blah blah blah. It has a virtual DOM, which is an object with some keys on it. There's nothing magic there. You know, if you sat down with you know what, I'm gonna try and make React. By the end of the day, you'd have something pretty okay that would pretty much solve the majority of the use cases that you actually care about, which is, I have some data, it changed, do a string replace. <laughs> <laughs> if you have no idea how to works, don't, try not to use it. It's that cool. This one is actually specifically for the guy I work with who's on here. Open the debugger. If your code's bugged, use the debugger. Do it now. Don't go like, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and then just like, you got just, you're staring at your cursor blinking, and you're like, That's, it must be that one last character I typed. <laughs> you sit there for like five minutes going, uh, and then you're like, maybe you go over to like the console and you just like scroll around a bit. Don't actually blink your nose. Just, if it doesn't work, <laughs> step one, obviously, is read the error message, of course. But after that, if you can't get past that, if it's just like, you know, there's no errors, it's just not working, open your debugger, step through it, figure out what's not working, and fix it. You'll, yes, it feels like hard work, but it's very productive because you'll learn so much by doing it, and you'll actually find the problem and fix it. Super handy. Uh, you can do it in Node. That's a less, most people know that these days, but yeah, you can go dash s inspect something in Node and it'll give you like a Chrome inspector. It's super handy. You can pause breakpoints, change stuff, blah, 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 exactly like Chrome. <sighs> Controversial slide number two. Don't transpire. Uh, it's just a massive waste of time. <laughs> so wanky. It's like, oh man, I couldn't possibly handle not having this one stupid feature. <laughs> Better take our entire code base run it through a transpiler, spit out code that's not what I wrote so I can't debug it. Or even if I do debug it, I'm like, oh, there's the problem. That doesn't reflect anything I've written at all. Like, it's this, it, you go, okay, you write client side code, I'll make a change, say, build. Oh, okay, refresh the page. If you just had code that was like, simply like a, like, like browser file, it's just a bundler, say done, bam, refresh page. Productivity loop increases. Debugging increases. Other people can read your code. Not everyone wants to read TypeScript. I certainly don't want to read TypeScript. Not everyone wants to see async away, blah, 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 blah. Sure, later async away is going to be native, great. You can chuck it in your thing and I won't read it, it doesn't care. It doesn't matter, whatever. But the point is, all of these, there's so many things that, that suck about it, and there's like nothing that's like, oh great, you can use the latest feature that won't be supported. Well, the spec will change, and then you're like, oh shit, I've got all this transpiler code that doesn't even meet spec. And then you just gotta go through your entire project and fix it later. Why? Why would you do that to yourself? It's, it's, ah, uh, man. Anyway. Yes, if it, it takes ages to build, anything over one second is abhorrent. Like, it, seriously, how can, I can't understand. So many people have client side projects that take like 10 seconds to build. How, how do you live with that? Like, if you do a change and you save it, then what do you do? It's not enough time to get a copy. But it's too much time to be like, oh, that was okay. 10 seconds. If I sat here, I literally couldn't even explain to you if I want to say, oh, let's just wait for 10 seconds. 
It would be so awkward. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how long it is. Uh, as I said before, you read code more than you write it. You will write code once, you will read it a hundred times. The half second you save using some wanky feature is going to cost you minutes to hours of time when it changes later. Or like you're like, wow, what does that ridiculous symbol that doesn't actually meet the spec do? And you're like, oh man, go to MDN, uh, MDN's down, oh shit. Like, just write code. Always be a refactor in it. Um, pass you's an idiot. Pass you can code for shit. Don't trust pass you. You're better. <laughs> this is true. If it's not true, you're not progressing. What you wrote a year ago should be embarrassing. It, you you want to look at that and go, man, I'm so shit. What was I thinking? Good. Do that. Fix it. Constantly fix it. Constantly update. Keep your shit fresh because that's what keeps productivity. Is productivity is is not. An, like people think tools are what creates productivity. Developers and developer happiness and, uh, and engagement creates productivity. People getting excited and getting, you know, the best tools in the world, if you're not interested in code, it's like, eh, you know, I'll just like do some stuff. If you're really interested in what you're doing, you would like your code base, that'll keep you productive, that'll keep you interested to keep working. That's way more important than tools. Module writers, write little stuff. This is really obvious. Write little things, decouple it. Uh, right wrappers, what's your success for inside? Computer is so fast. Uh, if you're a good extension, blah, 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 skip this part. Embedded hardware, don't. Yeah, no. Um, but other than that, everyone else, the computer is so fast. Like, don't go and like optimize shit for no reason. Just use standard stuff. Just use map. Just use reduce, blah, blah, blah. Don't use custom forwards just because you think this will be a hot loop. You'll buy out this hot loop later. The computer's not that fast. Um, of course, if you're not writing this in Nginx, I'll skip this. Uh, find hot loops. When you have loops, when you know this problem, next one, you need a profiler, find stuff that's hot, go in there, fix it up, get dirty. The code doesn't have to look good, it's going to run fast, really, really fast. Again, I'm not talking to most of you, I'm putting like two people in this room. Be super, super ugly. Things that are fast don't look good. Now, this is getting a bit fuzzy, I don't know. <coughs> Teams matter. You do spend huge amounts of time on your juniors, right? You are only as fast as the shittest person in your team because they will slow you down like nothing. And I don't mean that they are shit and they're like, oh, just uh, get them out of your team. No, bring them in, talk to them, help them constantly because yes, it's gonna cost your time. You think your time's really important, it's not, you're not that good. You know, you know, you're not worth twice what the, the junior's worth. You're worth like a little bit more. And if you can get that junior to be you, pretty much productivity-wise, you'll both learn so much that your productivity is just going to go through the roof. You have no one in your team that's like, oh, I don't really know how I'm going. Here's a pull request. You have to code review. You're like, wow, this is just, I can't. You know, and you've got like a thousand comments. You're like, okay, don't do that. This is terrible. <laughs> blah blah blah. That slows you down. You, you can have the conversation a couple of times, it's not going to happen first go, of course. You teach the person, they increase in productivity, in, in productivity and in quality. And you increase in the ability to teach and in the ability to write code, everything gets better. Be good to your juniors. If you don't have time, just write shitty software. Do what you want. Start from scratch a lot. Don't copy paste. Don't use code Yeah, this is the next one. It's a, bit, a little bit controversial. Um, <laughs> As I said, pass you is an idiot, so don't just copy a past project of yours because it's bad. Every previous project you've ever written is, is bad. Compared to the current project you're about to write, it's, it's the best because you have all the experience you learned through that previous one, all the mistakes you made, you can learn from them and you can make a better project. Yes, sometimes there are time constraints. I still think, unless your time constraint is like, oh my god, we need something up yesterday. Just start from scratch, write code. If you're going, man, that would be a lot of code to type, then it means you're typing too much code. You're using too many things, you're installing too many libraries, you're trying to do all this configuration, blah, blah, blah. When you just need to do the, just actually write code that solves the actual task that you have at hand. Most tasks that people do for like servers are like ridiculously mundane. You get a request, okay. You get the database, you get the results. You respond to the request. You don't need a million libraries to do that. So it's not that hard to write the second time you do it. This all sounds really hard. It is, get good. 
it's definitely worth it. Because if you can just sit down, not worry about all the noise, all the like, oh, this is the next hot library, blah, 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 you're gonna save so much time. Yes, it's gonna take time in the short term, but you get good and you just, you can just be productive. You can kind of quickly go, okay, you know, in the start, you're like, man, how do I know what's a good library, what's not, whatever you get. Yeah, time. Look at it, look at the API, that's nice and clean, cool. Read the code, pretty clean, pretty well laid out, it's got tests, great, use it. Try it real quick, didn't work, right, dump it, try it all. Takes a bit of time, but so much better. If you didn't guess, I uh, like cars, that's why I use car, I don't know if you That's me. Complaints? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you have one before. Oh, sorry, I didn't come back. Uh, you said something about TypeScript, you don't like to read TypeScript. Yeah. Say more about it? Uh, What's this place called? Briz JS? Briz JS, yeah. <laughs> Do I need to go further? TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. It's not JavaScript. <laughs> it's got stuff in there, like types that I don't care about. I, I spend zero time care for, like with type problems. Like, zero time. All of my problems are like logical problems, or I don't know how to use SQLize, or SQLize is being shit, or SQLize for an <laughs> error. And promises did that. All of my all of my problems are with tools, like they're never with types. So I, the time investment in that, in a thing that is like not fixed, it could change at any time. Like uh, you know, we're over TypeScript now. Now it's low, or it's some other stupid thing. Like it's just it's always changing. As Brent and I could say, always got a garbage. You know, uh, obviously that kind of went off the rails recently with the ES6 and 7, so that's some crazy shit in there that I don't like, but you know, whatever. <laughs> do what you want. But yes, again, like I said, right at the start, these are my opinions. If you like it, great, do it. You know, whatever you like is the most important, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't particularly like TypeScript, but I can see the value of TypeScript. Yeah, I can see the theoretical value, but I don't think it has very much value over not using it at all. Yeah. That's my shitty answer. Yep. Um, I like old stuff too. It's great. Um, I have to go. <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> Where's the old I don't Retro code. It's cool. I have to use like small libraries when I run my code on my Commodore 64 as well. Um, but I had to Google that SQLite thing. I've never heard of it. Like, really? I totally agree with like not importing tons of libraries and stuff. I'm just wondering why do you import like a SQL database into your project? Import a SQL database. As no, a dependency, yeah. Like that SQLized thing is to support a, a SQL database as a dependency. So we databases that are SQL. <coughs> I don't understand. Okay. Well, I, what do you mean? <laughs> do you mean why don't I use like a document store? Um, okay, so this is getting again off track, but let's just reveal more about myself. Um, I think every database is shit. Like so bad. I would never guess. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> so like every single document storage database I've ever come across like has critical mis missing features like, oh yeah, when will that be there? Uh, later. Is it there now? No. Is it there now? Oh yeah, it's there now. Oh great, cool, thanks. Yeah, that's good for certain projects, but it's not for like most businesses that actually need their data to be there after you rest done and it comes back and says it's there, then it's actually there. So that's one thing. Transactions. What's a document database that has transactions? Exactly. How do you do pay? How do you process money? You're just like, if you have a document database and you're like, oh, create a row, create a row, create a row, create a row, and it's like, yeah, done, 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 no. And you're like, database is now blank, ruined. What do you do? You go, oh, lucky I, every single piece of your code where you have to do a transaction, if you keep track of what you made, if one of them didn't work, go back and roll back all those. And if the rollbacks didn't work, retry them. If they didn't work, I guess just probably throw and explode the server and print a log and then someone has to go through your thing into the UI and go, oh, that's the dodgy data there and delete that. How do you not use transactions? I really don't understand how anyone can do anything without a transaction. Having said that, I hate SQL. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, like, this is the one thing where I, I actually don't, is I don't think there's a good solution for databases right now, currently. I think right now SQL is probably one of the best ones simply because it has pretty much all the features as you'd expect for a technology that's like 50 years old. It's got transactions, it's got uh, the word, there's a fancy word for like it's good now. Atomic. Yeah, atomic transactions. Uh, atomic, yeah, and like also. Um, immediate consistency. Immediate consistency, that's what I'm, 
all that sort of stuff is great. Relationships, yeah, they don't really matter as much as people like to think they matter. That's a personal opinion, of course. I know, I mean, obviously relationships matter, but I mean, hard-coded, like, database, ridiculous, this is like a thingy and it does whatever. Um, I think that, that the relationships, I think, can be formed in JavaScript or in your business layer, which they are anyway, because you always end up using an ORM that creates relationships, so that you can create the relationships. It's like, well, okay, cool, I guess. What's the point of these ones, then? Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much my yeah. <laughs> what about, um, what about writing it like using a pure functional kind of style of JavaScript and it would be stateless? Uh, you mean without a database? You can do that, go for it. But sometimes you need to know it. Yeah, you, most, in most like projects that do something, you, like you need state. I don't understand, what, can you give me an example of a stateless piece of software that's like not three lines of code? <laughs> <laughs> no? Yeah, I can't think of anything. Like everything, every project has a database pretty much. You need to store your data. I am actually, actually the biggest fan of the database that, that I am of is a thing, it's like a testing thing. It's like JSON DB. It just has a JSON file. And it's like a pet scrap into it. I love it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my favorite thing. The API is nice and clean. There's no relationships. It's structured nicely. It's transactional because it's the same file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so. Yeah. So if I was a mechanic, I should build my own cup. No. If you're a mechanic though, and you wanted to build a car, would you go and buy a car? And if I was a mechanic, I wouldn't trust myself to build a battery. Why would you? Because it's a piece of technology I wouldn't understand entirely. Yeah, good. <laughs> See, so the, the point, the, like, it's, it's a piece of technology that you may not necessarily be the highest skilled, and you wouldn't so trust. So, yeah, good. But I, you wouldn't, I wouldn't trust my this kids sounds hard. to be it in is, the same car. Sorry? I wouldn't trust my kids to be in that car. Don't put them in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the flip side, you know, you're going to be... Uh, so, as, from, take your example, okay. So that makes sense to a certain extent. Um, if you're a mechanic, you know the parts of the car that are like bolts and pistons and etc. Mechanics of at least pretty okay skill level could build an entire car because it's not that hard. They couldn't fabricate certain tools and components like I'm not suggesting you do. If there are small tools, then you know, bolts, for example, are all the same. They're all, you can buy a bolt. You know, you can buy valves, you can buy valve springs, you can buy retainers, blah, blah, blah. But putting that stuff together, you know, you, when you build a car, you don't go, oh, I will select a body. And then you're like, okay, now that I've selected my body, what drive train? It's not going to work. It doesn't work that way. And that's exactly what we're doing with frameworks. It's like, oh, I've selected my framework. Like, my example with frameworks, like, going for working cars as much as I dislike it, um, is you wouldn't go buy the frame for a house if you wanted to build a house that wasn't exactly what the frame was. Do you know what I mean? That's the problem with all these frameworks. They end up being exactly what the framework is. You can just, you can put your colors on, you can make it blue, but it's the same house. Everybody ends up the same house. And then, when there's a critical flaw in your framework, all your houses are broken, you know? And you don't know how to build it. You don't know how to deal with that. If you, yeah, basically, if you don't know how to deal with it, then you're screwed. So, yeah, good, learn how to build it. You don't have to build a battery, because a battery, in my opinion, is a little bit more like, it's a compartmentalized thing that's external to, like, like mechanisms, like a GSA. Sure. Um, so, like, a battery to me is like, a database or like an Excel service. It's, it's a thing that, yeah, shows chemistry. There's a lot of stuff there that maybe a, a machinist couldn't know about. It's fair enough, use that, and then complain about it later. You know, everyone does anyway. But in terms of actual cars, if you're, if you're a car manufacturer, if you're Pagani, they don't go out and they, yes, they buy an engine from Mercedes, but I mean, they're pretty well trustworthy. They've read the code, they know exactly how they work, they've tested them, and stuff. They don't just draw like, go, mm, who sells engines? Yeah, you. And it's like drop it in and they're just like, she doesn't make any power. Like, maybe you should shake that first, you know? So that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm not saying go down to the nth degree of metallurgy and figuring out how to make the best alloys and stuff. Yes, you gotta buy some steel, you gotta know how well to get things up for it. That's my shitty response. <laughs> yeah.
I think the thing about that also is that it's JavaScript all the way down until you hit like the C++ and the engine. Yeah. Like it's, it's all source code. Like there is Correct. no, like you said, there's no magic. There's no thing that's Correct. like a different category. It's like all code just like what you wrote all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. So, and that's exactly right. You can always look at the source code. That's the one of the best things I love about JavaScript is when shit goes wrong, you can at least find out why it's going wrong. You may not enjoy going through other people's code, but you can. You can totally do that. Uh, a lot of other projects, like say if you're a C-sharp developer somewhere wrong, 99% of the time you just go, damn, issue. You can't, you can't go and you can, so certain things it's got actual open source, maybe you've got a compiler thing, then you screw it. You just like, unless you know how to read byte code, like what are you gonna do? JavaScript, it's all there. Every time you have a problem, you can go into your node modules, you can see it working, you can inspect it. You can debug all the way down into that library, see where it screws up, etc. It's really good. I have used dot p to decompile C sharp DLL before. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is possible, obviously, but it's not fun. Um, and it, it doesn't really give you back all the metadata that is normally there, like class names. Yeah. It's just like, boom. Uh, great, I wonder what that does. <laughs> you got no idea. Cool. That is it. Got it? Yeah. Uh, a comment about the car analogy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with, but, yeah, yeah, with respect. Um, uh, software, the, the, the artifact it produces is only a blueprint. We have this magic machine that goes and constructs something that runs. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the, the analogy with the car, uh, with respect to the uh, audience, like, no respect for you. Um, <laughs> 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 it's because it's a, the, the analogy breaks, breaks down a bit. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everything no, you're working at is about is about designing tools to design designs. Yeah, so it's about to build real things. Absolutely, software is, is, is more like designing a car and then never actually. Well, when, when people use it, they're using like the design. So you can't like create a software, and then buy a software, and then it breaks, and other people's software keeps working. It's all the same thing. If your design is bad, it's actually one of the best things about it. Um, you know, when cars have problems, they you go, we've had a problem, and they recall a million. Uh, Mercedes just recently, by the way, look it up. Um, software, you go, oh, have no one noticed that? You fix it, and then ta-da, everybody's got their car fixed, sort of thing. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's you're completely right. Yeah, but I think I think it works in the level of understanding deeply how the things work. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got this friend, mechanic from from high school. Uh, he bought a car in. From a guy who thought the damage in the gear engine was uh, critical in the gear engine, mm -hmm. and he saw the car and he knew what the problem was. Yeah. Said, okay, how much was that? Six hundred. Okay, cool. He bought it. He bought the piece, a hundred bucks. He saw it in two thousand. Yeah. So the and deeply uh, understanding of how the machine works, yeah. how everything that it comprises. Mm -hmm. Is what uh, I think it works in this. Uh, yeah, like it wasn't the best analogy, I agree, but there's some relationship there. I think in that sort of situation, it's it, again, it's not like there are people out there that know how every single car works exactly, but you have a general idea of how everything works. Do you know what I mean? If you know cars, it's like I'm pretty much just a piston, and I know how this cylinders and blah blah blah. I know how that works. So even if you've never seen that car before, you can diagnose and and, and fix it. And it's the same as software as you may not know exactly how it's implemented, but just from the API and from how it's working, you can get a pretty good understanding of, of what it's doing. And if you don't have any idea how it's working, make it. Like, if, if, you, if you come across something and you're like, oh, I've got I have no idea, like, you call an API and then just some magic happens, sit down on a weekend if you've got some spare time or whatever, and, and make it just actually right. The other thing that's worth remembering is that we pretend that code is well constructed and bolted together and it's yeah. rigid. It's actually a bunch of sticky tape holding together with pieces absolutely. of wire and oh, super glue. Yeah, absolutely. So, the goal um, is to move away from that though. Yeah, exactly. So if you know where the sticky tape is, yeah. <laughs> you know exactly where it might come loose. That's exactly right. It's like if you, if you build a prototype car and you're like, oh man, I need to weld that. But you're like, oh, it's going to take a long time on a zip tie. Bam. You don't leave the zip tie there. You go back and you fix it. That's what I was saying about like refactoring and stuff. You, you need to take pride in your end product, and you need to go back and you, you, you want, okay, your code is never going to be good enough, hopefully. As in, you should never think your code is good enough to show someone be like, that's my code, look at it. And they're going to be like, 
wow, that's nice code. You generally know exactly how you're like, oh, I think this is pretty good. You show it to them and you are like, oh, so this is how we did the thing. Just don't remember that part. Uh, no, no, maybe I'm in the wrong branch. You know what I mean? Like, but you need to be pretty confident that it's pretty good and you always want to be making it pretty good. The goal is to have this beautiful piece of code that you can show someone and it is amazing, but it's, it's just never going to happen because you know business requirements change and things need to happen as real life comes in. But that's what I'm kind of tr trying to get to is trying to get really down to earth. It's like, what are you trying to do? If someone's like, please, can I have some data out of a database? Give them some data out of a database. Everyone's like, battle and like <laughs> shit that has nothing to do with what they're actually trying to do. It's just, just stuff. <laughs> no, you actually can easily collect, unfortunately, unless you want to send strings to. MySQL, which I don't really want to do. Well, I mean, eventually it's in the strings there, but I don't personally want to do that just yet. Like I said, maybe one day. Yeah, sure. That's it. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you.